David Nesmith, you have been found guilty by a jury of your peers. For the heinous crimes you have committed against the state of California, I sentence you to a life in prison without parole. You probably don't recognize the name David Nesmith, and you may not think you know who that is, but that's only because you've never heard him referred to by that name. All you've ever heard is... The hobo killer. Another victim of the hobo killer was found today. His body the was found by the train apparently tracks. put his hand right and inside the of the victim's corner. Tonight, the hobo killer strikes again. Could Grand Junction be next? I fucking hope so. Against the hobo killer. Another hobo killer's victim was found peed on before the murder. Much like a scene in the shock horror movie Evil Ever After. Was this the inspiration? Kill our homeless people, hobo killer. You are my hero. Right-wing Republicans have deemed rapper G-Bang's lyrics as influential to the hobo killer. We hear and uh, these an actual choline cleanser was, was used as well, too, because we found some gray matter in there. This is uh, evidence that I took home and looked at thoroughly. I pleasured myself, too. Authorities have found another victim of the hobo killer. His body decomposing for three whole days. After inspection, authorities have found semen in the funnel. Before the hobo killer trial, the hobo killer's most recent victim. The killer's victim was found. The hobo killer strikes again off the 105. His eyes were pulled out of their sockets and found two miles down the road. Dragged out his actual colon in and of itself. The hobo killer. The hobo killer. I'm renowned documentarian J.P. Ritter. Unless you've been living under a rock on the moon for the past three years, you've no doubt heard of the mysterious Hobo Killer, a man who's killed thousands of homeless people seemingly with no motivation. David Nesmith was finally brought to justice in December of 2006. Most people think the story ends there, but not me. I'm smarter than that. to delve a little deeper. We all know what he did, but I wanted to find out why. For me, it wasn't really a question of why. It was more of a question of why not. I mean, yeah, if you ask me, I'm going to tell you murder's bad, okay? But sometimes, sometimes you just got to kill someone. But I mean, these crimes seem to have no motivation. You know, I mean, if you killed your wife's secret lover in a fit of passion or something, yeah, you know, I mean, it'd be wrong. But at least, you know, the public would be able to understand. What's to understand? The feeling of killing another man with your bare hands? <laughs> there's just, uh, there's just no better feeling. It's an age-old question, but one that modern science has yet to come up with an answer for. What drives a man to kill? Hello there. If there's one thing I've learned in this business, it's that if you want answers, you have to go straight to the source. David is innocent. Even when he was growing up, and all of his friends were mindlessly running around saying faggot this and, and queer that, he never partook in that. No, he was always very sensitive when it came to the, the gay community. That's how he was raised. No, father, that's not what they're saying. Hmm? Hobo killer. They're saying that he killed homeless people. Oh, hobo killer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Well, no, I can see that. He always hated bombs.
Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that I saw the killer in him or anything, but, you know, he always, always sort of was that uh, destructive kid. Yeah. I mean, there was that one time, he and I went on, a, went on a camping trip when I was 10, and uh, he found this little squirrel, right? So he picks up this living thing and he hucks it against a tree. <laughs> Just completely out of the blue, uncalled for. Any other... Um... Well, I mean, that was the most dramatic thing, but, you know, he was doing stuff like that all the time. Sticking firecrackers up frogs' butts and picking off rabbits with his BB gun. Go! <laughs> there was that one time I helped him bury that lady's corpse. Wait, uh, wait you helped him bury a corpse? Well, you, you know, I didn't say anything about it for a long time, but... I suppose now it's all right, right? So why the homeless? Well, I mean, come on, who's gonna miss them, right? What, other bums? When did you, what first brought you to that realization? I had, uh, I'd had a really rough day at the slaughterhouse, right? And uh, I was driving home and I was thinking about how much I really wanna gut some dude like a fish. You know, just uh, just to let off some steam. And all of a sudden, this crazed homeless guy just walks out in the middle of the road, right? Just, just right in front of my car. And I hit the brakes. And... He's not moving. He's just standing there, and, he, and he's and he's just staring at me. You know, and it's this cryptic stare, like like he's trying to burn a hole through my soul. And then finally, he just gives me this smear of a look, and he flips me off. I'm not gonna take that shit from some fucking bum, right? I get the bath that's in my car, and I jump out. And I just start wailing on this guy. I mean, I am beating the shit out of him. Like, he's probably dead, but, 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 but I keep pounding. I, I've got blood all over my arms, all over my face, but I'm, I, I don't care. I'm just in the zone, man. At what point did you realize what you were doing? The whole time. Well, okay, um, I, I guess what I mean is, uh, when did you snap out of it? Probably took a good 10 minutes. And I finally saw pound on this guy, and it, and it dawned on me. This is how I could satisfy my obsession without drawing any attention to myself. I had this blanket in the car, right off the bat of it. I knew I had to get out of there, I had to go quick, so, uh... Out of it. And that was it. You know, I, 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 I waited a few days to see if anybody noticed. <laughs> no one did. I was in the clear. We were onto him from day one. Unfortunately, we really can't do anything in the public eye until we have something more concrete than we had in the first couple of instances. I mean, here we have a crime and no witnesses. No one knew the victims. It's really hard to convict when that's the case. Well, but I mean, come on. You guys could have at least, like, gone over to his place and asked him a few questions or even brought him in for questioning. I'm sure we could have gone to visit him, but without a warrant, he had no obligation to even let the officers in the door. And bringing him in for questioning, I mean, without anything more concrete, that was just out of the question. Well, I mean, come on, he would have let you guys in for a few minutes. I mean, he wants to maintain his innocence, right? Look, you and me talking here, everyone in our office wanted to do exactly what you're talking about, okay? Myself included. But without anything more concrete, I mean, we could have had a very, very serious lawsuit on our hands. And believe me, there's nothing more frustrating than having to defend our department against a guy like that. He was always such a sweet boy. Yeah. So, so sensitive and artistic, too. Oh, yeah. Remember that drawing he did when he was six for us? I never did understand why that Mrs. Stevens didn't like that drawing. Well, I guess she couldn't distinguish the artist from the odd. 
That picture clearly depicted a child with severe psychostabiotic disorder that has obviously manifested itself in a very violent manner. Much to his parents' protest, young David was required to visit Dr. Vargas in order to avoid expulsion. I had four sessions with David before his parents transferred him to the Burbank school solely to pull him out of our weekly sessions. Is that enough? What can you tell us about those sessions? Well, not a lot. I can't tell you a lot. I, I, despite the recent court ruling, I'm still bound by the confidentiality agreement that I had with young David. Well, okay. Didn't you testify? Weren't you Yes. Yeah. All right, look, I can... I can tell you what I told them. And what I told them was is that young David had been exhibiting signs of this type of behavior since he was a very, very small child. And unfortunately, I was unable to help him. And here we are. Can't win them all. Dr. Vargas was an asshole, all right? Psychosomatic this, stabiotic that. All the guy did was talk. Talk, 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 talk. And all, all I could think about was, damn, I really want to see this guy bleed through his eyes. Without the kind of help that Dr. Vargas or really any professional psychiatrist could have provided, David's disorder continued to manifest itself into his later years. Well, all right, sure. David made violent videos, I suppose, as part of his Class A-V work. But that was fairly common. I mean, the kids. I mean, not so much the girls, but... Yeah, come on, teenage boys. They're into that sort of thing. I mean, horror movies and action movies, and the rap music and the violence. I mean, I've never... That's not my cup of tea. I've always been into the uh, foreign cinema myself. So I don't think the kids got that for me. I grade formatically. Content-wise, whatever the kids put in the video is entirely up to them. It, it's academic. This isn't theoretical physics. If the kids show up straight and they do the work and they put forth the effort, and they learn the fucking craft, I feel compelled to give my students A's. Does this deserve an A? I don't watch half these things. Those who were responsible for David's well-being as a child failed miserably in their duties to care for his well-being. As a result, David was released into the world at age 18 with mental problems that would only get worse. Well. You know, after high school, I kind of lost touch with him. I started going to Cal State, Northridge, and, and I just got real busy with all my classes and everything, so. Did, did David go to college? <laughs> no, no. College just wasn't for me, you know? He moved into an apartment downtown, and after that, I talked to him on the phone every couple of months, and I saw him maybe three, four times. Well, I was, you know, I was surprised though. By what? Well, I mean, he moved into a, into a pretty nice building and all he had was that crappy job down at the slaughterhouse. That motherfucker never paid his rent on time. He's got dogs in the apartment, they're shitting all over the place, he pissed all over the toilet. That's okay, he's Christian, he's Jesus uh, loving. He's a filthy pig from the other shit woman. He was just a horrible, horrible tenant. I am so happy that he's out. I don't care what you Jesus like to say about that guy. I am a dirty Jew. I want that money! He's in jail now. Stay in jail. Rot in jail. And I hope that a 300-pound Filipino named Drop fucks you right up the ass, you filthy pig. I just took the first job that would have me. You know, plus the slaughterhouse. You know, I just, it felt right. Did you ever have any weird encounters with your neighbors? I mean, you came home soaked in blood every night. No, I, I pretty much just tried to keep to myself, you know. Um, I did have a couple of neighbors that would make that a little, a little difficult. But. 
I come from a really small town where neighbors really try to get to know one another, really try to make a community with each other. I know that's not normal in L.A., but I have to at least try. If people just aren't receptive, so be it. But I can't just walk by someone every day without even knowing who they are, you know? I don't get it either. Asshole? Well, yeah, there was something odd about him, but... I mean, he never seemed like any kind of serious threat. He never freaked us out or anything. That's not true. What? Remember the pool party? He came down with his work clothes still on. He was all covered in blood. Wait, when? I was lying on my stomach, sunbathing with my strap undone, and he sat down next to me. Remember? He kept saying that if I wanted to turn over, he wouldn't mind rubbing lotion on me. Oh, come on, Bill. I know you remember this. Look, I think I'd know if I remembered, okay? Come on, Bill. It was the party where John got the keg. Oh, yeah, no, I don't remember that at all. Ah, uh, Melinda. You know, she was something special. It's a shame about that husband of hers, though. What do you mean? Well, he beats her. <laughs> he said what? It should be obvious that David's word can't be trusted, but, for the record, Melinda has never showed any signs of physical abuse, and their neighbors describe them as nothing besides a genuinely happy couple. But, what of David's love life? I need more grape with the Salisbury steak at 67. I up with David almost a year ago. As soon as I discovered what he was doing. Certainly did. He would come home late every night, all covered in blood. He would tell me it was from his job at the slaughterhouse, but it always looked too fresh. And at what point did he admit to you that he had been killing homeless people? Well, we had a heated argument and he just blurted it out. I asked him why the blood on his clothes looked darker than the blood on meat packages at the market and why he was always covered in dirt. That's a lot. Oh, oh, Amber used to understand. I would tell her about these urges and how I had to keep them quelled. And she'd rub my hair and tell me everything's okay, and that she understood. <sighs> Turns out that was a big fucking lie. He told me he would think about killing people, and he did mention that homeless people were a good target, but I don't actually think he would do it. I mean, I guess I was just naive. It, it took me a while, but I did eventually put the pieces together. Amber was always wrong for our David. Yeah, she never had faith in him. No. Well, not the, the kind of faith that one needs to have in their partner. She was a bitch. A conniving little bitch. I mean, a little boy gets convicted of this crime he didn't commit, and what does she do? Not a goddamn thing. That's right. That's why. Nothing. Nothing. I don't know. I guess a part of me always loved him. <laughs> I do think his idea of a three-way with Melinda would have been fun. He said what? Okay, this interview's over. Honey. Honey, no. I, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> so, now, here we are. A psychopathic sexual deviant is living among us, free to kill as many hobos as he so chooses. The only question now is, what do we do about this? Well, I wish it was After our encounter in her garage, Miss Finkelstein invited me into her home for an interview, provided I grant her comprehensive interdiction rights regarding her appearance in this film. Well, our big break came when the first matching DNA results came back. That's when we first were able to place him under arrest. When was that? November of 2005. That doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, with the DNA evidence, why did it take you guys so long to convict him? 
Well, there are a million plausible alibis for DNA evidence. And like I said before, we have very little to work with. Anything else you can think of that you might find interesting? No, no. Not that I can think of. Alright, well, um, thanks for your time. Oh, wait, I have video of the, of the last time I saw him. Uh, would you be into that? Hey, buddy, how's it going? Good. Yeah, good. Where'd you get this thing? Uh, this thing? Yeah, I got myself a little Labor Day present. Oh, uh, yeah? Don't most people just get drunk on Labor Day? Labor Day. Yeah, well... <laughs> What are you gonna do? Are you gonna make a movie? Are you gonna film or what? No, no, I'm just gonna film my vacations and stuff. I can just put together little five minute clips and send them out online. Dude, you gotta keep me in the loop with that. Yeah, I will, I will. Yeah, so what you been up to, man? Not much, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Killing hobos for sport. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's uh, kind of fucked up. <laughs> Fuck you and your fucking moral bullshit, man. <laughs> 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 that thing's not on, is it? I thought he was kidding, you know? David and I always shared our sick sense of humor. <laughs> Holy shit, dude! Oh, hey, buddy. This guy was a runner. You up for an old-fashioned burial? Huh? Just like the old days, dude. Grab his legs. Hey, you wanna go to the Viper Room tomorrow? Viper Room? Yeah, my girlfriend's roommate's got this thing, some band crap, I don't know, it's like a showcase or some shit. You cool? Yeah, that sounds good. We were not able to press charges against his friend. Why not? Well, none of the DNA samples matched his, and without any proof that he was involved, we can't confiscate anything in his possession. At least, not without the risk of an inadmissible evidence charge. If that had happened, our credibility would have been gone. We wanted this guy locked away, so we did everything by the book. And, um, we did it. We got our conviction. David was convicted of these crimes, but is he really the one to blame? Most people look at David and see a heartless, soulless killer. I see a small, helpless child who's whose mental problems were denied by his parents, untreated by psychiatric professionals, and ignored by his friends, neighbors, lovers, and associates. David may have been the one who actually physically killed all these hobos, but surely these people need to stand up and take their share of the blame. In fact, society needs to stand up and take its share of the blame. In the end, isn't this whole problem society's fault? Be that as it may, the city's found its scapegoat and dubbed him the hobo killer. The conviction stands, and David is locked up, far away from the streets, where he can't do any harm to any more hobos. I sentence you to life in prison without parole. Believe me, there's nothing more frustrating than having to defend our department against a guy like that. <laughs> you wanna come on in for a few minutes? Oh, it's so good! Well, all right, sure, David made violent videos as part of his Class A-V work, but that sort of thing's common. I mean, not so much with the girls, I suppose, but teenage boys, I'm into that sort of thing. You know, it's action movies and horror movies and the MTV and the, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? Hey, action. Action. Sorry, a little time to prepare. <laughs> he, to prepare. he does. How many directors do you sit by? The director tapes his mic. Well, 
I guess she couldn't distinguish the artist from the art. My worst work. We love y'all. It's not. <laughs> this is the place. It's the place we looked up online. The top. All right. We're going to uh, Judge DeVilbis' place right now. We're going to try and get a few words with him about this uh, whole hobo killer thing. See if we can't. Uh, Judge DeVilbis, Judge DeVilbis, my name's JP Ritter. I'm First fucking line, I can do the rest of it. Let me do that. Okay. Where the chain smoke, dude. Oh, man. Jake, Jake, one for the team. Should we move it over to the coke way? Dude, I really want to it. Yeah, that's a crowbar. That's a crowbar. And that's a telephone. Ah, Melinda. She was something special, eh? You know? It's a shame about her husband, though. What do you mean? Well, he beats her. Shit. In the clip, face tracks and half a sec. Keep the spot burning, I'm sick of this half a sec. She tried to 
come with it, you bring like half a cent. I be serving all the food, taking cash and checks. Who stamps to let? Cause I stay on my grind, I'm trying to take what's mine. And waste less time because you can't decipher any problem without paper. I learned that in this game, everybody is a chaser. And if you don't think so, then hold me your right. Tapes like wait, clocking the well so I can brag about it later.